Welcome to New Entity Organization and Documentation. This is an overview of the formation of a for-profit entity and the documentation you need. I'd like to thank you all for tuning in to our presentation. Before I begin, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. The views and opinions expressed during this presentation are those of the presenter and do not represent legal advice. This webinar is based solely on the professional opinions and experience of the presenter and is made available for information and experience sharing purposes only. If you have any questions that do not get addressed during this webinar, please reach out to me and I'll do my best to get back to you very quickly. My contact information is on this page and it is on the last slide. Today I'll be talking about the three basic types of entities used by many startups and early stage companies, LLCs, S-Corps, and C-Corps, and the types of documentation used by these entities. So here's a bit more about me for your review. I've spent the last 25 years working directly with startups and early stage companies with corporate organization, operations, management, human resources, and fundraising activities. This presentation represents those years of experience and best practices I've learned along the way. So before I jump into entity formation, let's go over some of the basic, very basic differences between the three entities we're discussing here. This chart is not exhaustive. It just demonstrates some high level comparisons my chart here lists the three most entities used um, in the market today. There are many types of entities, but these are the three used by startups and early stage companies, especially if they're going to raise money in the future. So let's go over some of these items. Limited liability protection for owners. And you can see that all three entity types have that statutory protection. Can be owned by non-US citizens. And you can see that the corporation and LLC are similar. Must be owned by US citizens or resident aliens. Now you can start to see a pattern of the differences emerging. Can only be owned by other business entities. Can be, not only, pardon me. C corporation and LLCs. Again, you see the difference in the S corporation. Can have unlimited number of shareholders and members. C corporations and LLCs have no limitations here. Can have more than one class of stock or ownership interest. The C corp and the LLC have no limitations. Again, you're, you're realizing the restrictions of an S corporation. Income of entity is taxed separately from income of owners, and that only applies to the C corporation. The tax on entities income and the deductions flow through to the entity owners for the S corporation and the C corporation. So the biggest takeaway when selecting the type of entity you choose should be an analysis of how each of these entities is taxed, not only on the company, but on the owners if applicable. For any tax related questions, be sure to consult a tax professional for the best advice on which entity to proceed. The first step in forming your company is to file a corporate organizational document with the state agency that handles the corporate filings for your state. That may be the Secretary of State in many cases, or in the case of Arizona, it's the Arizona Corporation Commission. Typical names for the organizational document are articles or certificate of organization. And this is for a limited liability company or a certificate or articles of incorporation for a corporation. This depends on the state in which you form your entity, but the names are similar, pretty similar throughout. Once you have formed your entity and the document has been approved by the state, then you can obtain your employer identification number from the IRS. Be sure to get this number for any entity because you want to separate the liability from your personal liability. You also start to build credit for your company with a separate EIN number. One option you can do once the entity is formed is file for a DBA. You sometimes see doing business as. 
or a trade name. It's a name separate from the name of the corporation under which you can do business. You can have more than one DBA. And I have a little note here. Be sure to search your name before you do any business with the company. You want to make sure the name is available for use before you make any business transactions. Unwinding this is difficult. Your internal governance is very important. These documents establish processes, powers, and procedures the company will follow when certain events arise, such as transferring ownership, a management disagreement, or establishing the authority of management. For LLCs, the internal governance is memorialized in the operating agreement of the company. Like I say, this document is internal and not filed publicly. For corporations, the governance guidelines, at least one set of them, are in the bylaws. At the beginning stage or at formation, the company will prepare a set of organizational minutes that appoints the governing board or managers, authorizes the issuances of the equity, appoints officers, authorize banking, and other organizational items as may be necessary. This is more of a corporation act versus an LLC act because these authorities are established in the operating agreement for an LLC. At formation, a company will create their capitalization table. This details the issuances of the founders, any equity incentive plan issuances, and I'll provide more detail about that in a bit. And in the future, it will also detail any investor issuances. It should be noted that the capitalization table requires its own webinar, and we do have one available if you are interested. It also comes with a companion template, like this webinar comes with a checklist. Some other founding internal documents include founder vesting agreements. This is important with multiple founders. Establishing a vesting schedule for your founders ensures that people don't cut and run with their ownership and are incentivized to stick around and do their job until the vesting is complete. Investors really like these documents too. Another very important document is the Inventions Assignment and Confidentiality Agreement. Now it's called many things, has many titles, but this is the, the topic. Every founder and service provider should enter into this document to ensure that any intellectual property created by them during their service with the company remains with the company. This also ensures they keep company secrets to themselves. A shareholder agreement is for, company, for corporations. This is an additional document to accompany the bylaws that covers restrictions on stock transfers, board appointments, and other rights not found in the bylaws. For LLCs, your operating agreement will contain all of these items, so a separate equity ownership agreement is unnecessary for LLCs. So now it's time to make sure that any intellectual property is appropriately owned and kept alive. Evaluate when and if your IP is registrable or patentable with the USPTO or appropriate government agency. You can and should get this done with legal help. There are costs involved, so be sure to add those to your budget. Be sure, to, be sure any current intellectual property is assigned to and owned by the company. Some assignments need to be filed with a government agency like the USPTO. It's important that all IP is in the name of the company. This increases your company's value. Then be sure that all maintenance filings, if applicable, are up to date. It is vital that your IP remains current so it cannot be owned by someone else in the event a maintenance filing was missed. Some IP will need a filing after a certain number of years, sometimes up to 25 years to remain alive. And this is easily overlooked due to the extended time between these filings. So take advantage of a docketing these deadlines. It will save you, I promise. 
Now a couple of business related documents that will be useful. Bilateral or mutual NDA or two-way NDA. This involves two parties where both parties anticipate disclosing information to one another that each intends to protect from further disclosure. This NDA is used when two companies are considering a joint venture or merger. A unilateral NDA is used by an entity when it wants to provide confidential information with another entity. This will take place like in an M&A transaction or if a company discloses marketing secrets to an ad agency. This is also referred to as a one-way NDA. The next set of documentation we will discuss is how to document bringing on service providers and compensating them, such as advisors and consultants and employees. An economical way to compensate your service providers at the early stages is to issue stock options or unit options in lieu of cash compensation. You can utilize an equity incentive plan for LLCs and corporations and establish it with a plan document which assigns a specific number of equity units or shares that are available for issuance under the plan. This number cannot be changed without the approval as prescribed in the plan document or in the internal governance documents we discussed earlier. The equity incentive plan falls under the guidelines of the Internal Revenue Code, so it comes with a strict set of procedures. Keep in mind that the equity incentive plan can only be utilized for persons providing services to your company, not for investors or other individuals not involved in the day to day. You will need to track all of your equity plan issuances on your capitalization table. Now let's go over the documents you need to have on hand to contract with the service providers. The independent contractor agreement used for consultants and advisors is used for service providers that are not employees or they're called 1099 service providers. This document will detail the term of the services, their services to be provided, their rate of pay if applicable, among other things. Each service provider must sign a non-compete invention assignment agreement like we mentioned before to ensure that the service provider maintains confidentiality, appropriate IP ownership, and will not compete with the company. Employees will enter into an employment agreement that typically comes in the form of an employee offer letter. This too details rate of pay, the term of employment, and employee duties, among other things, and who they report to. Along with the independent contractor agreement and employee offer letter, you might also provide your service providers with an equity grant agreement. This would memorialize the number of shares or units they might receive for compensation from your equity incentive plan. Briefly about insurance. Be sure to research what type of insurance you may need for your business. Here are some of the more important types of insurance that should be considered. Now, depending upon the services you provide, you may need additional coverage. For example, if you're providing professional services, you may need to have errors and omissions insurance coverage over and above your normal insurance policies. Now that you have all your documentation in place, it is imperative to keep your documents in a convenient and organized place, such as cloud storage, that can be accessed from your laptop and your phone. Many of us are making business relationships outside of the office setting, so having the, this access helps facilitate these transactions. A complete and organized data storage room is needed when considering taking on investors. It can make or break a deal. Be sure to document 
termination dates of any of your contracts so you can keep them alive or effectively terminate them according to their terms. Now, some contracts may require a 30 to 60 days notice in the event you plan to terminate the contract. So you don't follow the contractual terms, you may inadvertently be renewing it without knowing. Keep your capitalization table up to date at all times. Overlooking any equity issuances can be very difficult to recreate later and will negatively affect everyone prorably. Lastly, be sure your state filings are kept up to date with any annual filing requirements. If you let that lag, you run the risk of losing your corporate existence. You also run the risk of losing your corporate name. I would like to thank you for taking the time to view our presentation. Here again is my contact information. Our YouTube channel is filled with short videos that discuss corporate organization, fundraising, securities, regulation, investment vehicles, terminology and term sheets, and so much more. I've also posted our most recent webinars there. As a reminder, we are providing our corporate organizational checklist as a companion to this video to use for your own entity.